right, everybody, we are here back for our next program and our next house. Hi, Susan. Hi, Rachel. Hi. So we, we just moved right next door. <laughs> yes, we did. Um, we are back again in the 18th century and again in England, as I mentioned. And um, this house is I wanted to share with you because this house, it's known as the Great House. It's circa 1750. And by the way, in case you don't know what circa means, circa means you don't know exactly the year. So circa means approximately mm -hmm. seven, 1750, could be a little older, could be a little younger. So you're safe if you say circa. So this house is circa 1750, and it's known as the Great House, and it was owned by Vivian Green. Now, in case you don't know who Vivian Green was, Vivian Green was one of the first grand dames of antique dollhouse collecting. She lived in England, and she was passionate about dolls' houses as I am. And she scoured the English countryside looking for them. Whenever she would hear that there was a dollhouse in this stately home or that attic somewhere, she would somehow find a way to get an invitation. And she researched heavily, and she was one of the first people that really took this uh, subject seriously. And um, she acquired houses whenever she could. Um, and she opened her own museum. It was called the Rotunda, and it was in Oxford. She also was a very good and very important author. She wrote several books. This is one of them. It's called English Dolls Houses by Vivian Green. She also wrote a book called Family Dolls Houses. And um, as I mentioned, I started my collection. My mother started my collection for me when I was seven. And I was given several books by my parents um, when I was a little girl. And they became like my textbooks. And this was one of them. And I would just lay there and just study and study and study for hours. And the photographs are not even very good. They're typically just uh, black and white photos, as you can see. Mm -hmm. But I would just study and study and study every detail of home. Oh, here we go. Every detail of every kitchen, every sitting room, every bedroom. What did they have? How did they do it? And they were, they were just my textbooks, really. And um, books are very, very important. And uh, this book you can still find, although it's out of print, not difficult to find. And I highly recommend, if anyone's interested in collecting or just wants to study about um, doll's houses, that books are a wonderful way to do so. And then when I see a doll's house in a museum, I'm like, aha, I remember that from this book. And in this case, it was especially special because I was able to acquire one of Vivian Green's doll's houses. I actually have four in my collection, and this is the, probably the largest. And, um, and, oh, and I also wanted to say that an American counterpart to Vivian Green is Flora Gell Jacobs. You may have heard of her. So she lived in Washington, D.C., and she also was passionate about antique doll's houses, and she collected um, heavily and opened her own museum called the Washington Dolls and, and Toy Museum, Dolls House and Toy Museum. Um, sadly, both of those museums are no more, as we know so many museums have have closed, and both both of the ladies are are gone now. But um, we have their books. We have their books to 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 study and to love and to learn from. And yeah. Oh, in fact, is that it? I think that might be. No, that's some. No, that is it. There we go. There's no, your that's house. a different. No, that's a different one. That's a different. One, but it is in here. It looks somewhere. very similar. <laughs> it's very similar. Yes. You know, there was a a typical uh, Georgian style and Palladian style that was very um, popular during that period. So anyway, this, she named all of her houses, and this one is called the Great House. And uh, I call this a grand 18th century baby house, and you can see why. It is very, very grand. So um, we'll go inside. Here we go. And this door I have to prop open with my little nifty little high chair. So now we can get a better look. Um, I think perhaps we'll start in the bedroom. So, oh, where's my pointer? Okay. So, um, again, the dolls are, are are really critical. And this doll, I just love her. And she um, is all original and in original clothing. And you can see these are her undergarments. This is her little her, her little uh, corset and her slip and her pockets. And this is called a her pomander or pincushion, doubled as both. Now, 
I do have in my collection dolls, early English wooden dolls that have been redressed. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to find dolls in their original clothing. And there was this big fad in the 60s, 70s, 80s to redress early English wooden dolls whose clothing was starting to tatter and fray, especially if it was made with silk, which as you know, doesn't, doesn't hold up too well over many, many uh, centuries. And there was a, there was, it became sort of popular to redress these dolls, and I just don't, I just don't agree with that at all. Um, whenever I can, I will, I, will, I will always, always prefer a doll in its original clothing. And if it doesn't have its original clothing, I, I'd rather have it in its undergarments. Mm. Because A, it's original, and B, you can see, you can learn from it. Um, she's in her bedroom, so she can be in her undergarments. Now, these are called pockets. And they weren't pockets as we know them, but they were usually, it was a, either a single or a double pocket. And these were worn underneath the lady's dress, and there were slits in the dress that they could access the pockets through. And they would use the pockets to store change or hankies or a fan or all kinds of things. I have one uh, larger early English wooden doll whose pocket has a little uh, handkerchief holder attached to it. Um, I have here to show you a real size pocket from a, a regular size person. And here we go. So that was a regular pocket. And it'd be worn around your waist and tied. And then you would access the pocket through a slit in the side of your dress. I love now, that. Oftentimes, um, collectors will exhibit their dolls. They will show them with these pockets on the outside of their clothes. And that's simply because so you can see them, it's for practical reasons. I have this one phenomenal early English wooden doll and she has a larger doll and she has the most ornate pockets I've ever seen in miniature, they're incredible. They're heavily embroidered with the family crest, with initials, with beautiful uh, figures, everything. They're absolutely incredible, many, many colors. And I showed them, I wrote an article about her for, again, Doll News, and I showed a photograph of the doll with the pockets on the outside, and I got, apparently, a, a letter to the editor was written, doesn't she know better? Pockets were meant to be worn underneath the dress. So I learned my lesson. I will always put a footnote now. <laughs> uh, yes, I know that. But I should have put a footnote because it is potentially not good education for the readers. I should have put a footnote. Pockets were meant to be worn underneath the dress. However, so that you can see them, I've placed them on the outside. That doll, um, by the way, has a fabulous silk dress that is starting to, to lose its integrity. It's starting to have a little bits of tearing, separation, etc. And if I had to lift that gorgeous 250-year-old dress up and down to show people the pockets, the dress would be gone. So anyway, but they were meant to be worn underneath. Now this item here, which I mentioned is um, a palm and or sachet and doubles as a pin cushion, you can see her little pin, that would have also definitely been worn underneath the dress and it was to perfume the lady, to freshen her. You have to remember people didn't take baths very frequently in those days. Mm. <laughs> so that kind of helped in that department. And then it was also used as a pin cushion. So, um, People are always surprised to hear that ladies did not have buttons or hooks then. They used pins to keep their clothing shut. And uh, there was often, you know, when a woman was wearing a, a, an actual dress, there was a piece here called the stomacher, and then it was called a robe a la Francaise that went over it, and everything was pinned together with pins. And that's where the term pin money comes from, because you would often be given little bits of change from your husband to spend on pins. So that's where the word uh, term pin money comes from. Now here in this room we have uh, something very special indeed. This is a miniature 18th century paper doll and she only has one dress. I'm sure they asked, she had more but they probably were lost. But the fact that this tiny little bit of paper, so small, could last all these hundreds of years. You know, an 18th century miniature paper doll. I, I'm just, I was so excited to find that, it was, it was crazy. Um, what else can I show you here? I, 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 as again, I like to say that we, we learn history through these houses. This, this is just a little chamber pot, and probably most of you know what a chamber pot is, but when I give tours to children, I'll pass this around, or one from another house, and I'll say, what do you think that is? And they usually say a cup or a bowl. I say, well, actually, that was a potty. That's what they, use, what they had to use to go potty, and they're like, what, mm -hmm. what? And children today often don't know that they didn't have indoor plumbing in the 18th century. They didn't have indoor plumbing in the 19th century until quite late. 
And so this is how they, they um, where they had to go to the bathroom and then the servants had to dump it out. And that leads me to the next piece, which is this. Oh, on the bed. It's called, I'll pass this around to people and I'll say, what do you think that is? Most people, the most common answer I get is a darning egg. This actually is a vinaigrette. And what it, what it would be was this twists off and inside there's a little rag and it would be soaked in vinegar or perhaps perfume. And then there are little holes at the end and the lady would wear it around her wrist. And when she's walking by somewhere where there was chamber pots or dumped out onto the street, she could oh, try to cover that door with water. Also, that. women did were wearing very, very tightly laced corsets in those days. And so oftentimes they could barely breathe. And so if they started to swoon, they could revive themselves with the vinaigrette. Um, this piece is a curious piece. Not 100% sure what that is, but our best guess is that it was a foot warmer. So it would have been filled with boiling water, and then you could sit and place your feet on top. You have to remember things were very, very cold. There was no heating then. And here's her little coral beads. I discussed before that coral was thought to ward off illness and evil, so there's her little coral necklace. Mm -hmm. And almost every house, I have a working clock. So I love miniature clocks. And if they're not working, I have a wonderful clock maker who gets them to work for me. And if I wind it, And then I put it here, back on the mantle. I start the pendulum. Can you hear it? We sure can. So, especially in the houses that are electrified from the inside, peeking through the window and hearing that tick tock, mm -hmm. tick tock, tick tock. To me, it brings the house to life. So I have a working miniature clock in every single house. Love that. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, I love the little sleeping mask, too. You just have so many little touches. Oh, that would not have been a sleeping mask. That's not a sleeping mask? That is a mask for a masked ball. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, here in the kitchen, all kinds of crazy things that they used to cook. And here's the clockwork jack I described before. This is quite an ornate one. And it would have operated spits, which would have been held on, on the spit rack. This part of the spit rack is not, not there anymore, to help to rotate the meat over the fire. This is called a sawtooth trammel. Again, it goes up and down. You could you would you would hang the piece of meat or fish, whatever you were cooking, on the end, and then you could raise it or lower it by the sawtooths. This is called a clockwork jack hastener. This had a clockwork mechanism inside that turned the meat around and around. Again, this would go right in the fire and so on and so forth. There were just all kinds of things that, um, that they used then, which we don't use anymore. And I have these little booklets. I mean, I have lots of, lots of books also, but these little booklets are very easy to get. So here we have one called Domestic Bygones. They're by Shire. And you can order them, and they talk all about all these odds and ends and ways that they used to cook. Here's this one's called Old Cooking Utensils. And this one's called Laundry Bygones. So it's just fun to learn and, and, and read, and that's how I, I know what to put in my houses. It, this helps us so much to know that your favorite references. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's you great. Can... Take, take screenshots, everybody, when yeah. you're seeing this, and then you can order it yourself. Now, another thing I wanted to share is, um, remember I said that I'm like an artist with this palette when I put together a house? Mm -hmm. So one thing that's always fun is the food. So if you look at that basket there in the corner, you have some sort of um, berries, fruit, whatever inside. And um, this, this is um, actual fruit that was meant to be fruit. But those are just little um, pieces of nature that I found. Whenever we go hiking, I'm always looking for little berries that I can dry. Here's some more. These are all from a hike or a walk. Wherever I go in the world, I find different species. So I have loads and loads of different berries. 
and pine cones and all kinds of things. And here's just a little sampling of some. These are all things I've collected on little walks or hikes all over the world. And I, I either let them dry naturally in the air, or sometimes I'll put them, I think these I put in, our, in the oven. Oh, I <laughs> Just love a it. very low temperature for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And they darken them, but I think they look lovely as food. And they really do look like food. Oh, that's such a great idea. We're all gonna go out and make our own little <laughs> And here's little a little miniature basket. shell, by the way, back in the bedroom. Yeah. You, can, you can collect miniatures wherever you go. Wherever I go in the world, there are always shells, berries, doesn't matter where you go, you can find them. So I'm always looking, I'm always looking, looking, looking. <laughs> oh, and here, Love that idea. These, are, these are just little twigs, little sticks that I found for the firewood. Love that. So I have boxes of twigs, boxes of You're pine giving cones. us so many <laughs> ideas of where to start just in our own inspiration and, and creating our own houses and vignettes. Oh, I wanted to show you, here's a large example, sorry of a coral and bell's rattle. This would have been for a, a regular sized child. So again, the coral idea. And I'm gonna put this down there. And then this is the tiniest little coral and bell's rattle I've ever seen for Aww. a doll. Oh, so cute. Yeah, so that's really special. Um, now moving over to this side, maybe should I stand here? Yeah. Okay, so, um, this is a what you know, this is an example of an early English wooden doll. Her dress is really starting to go, but would I ever take that magical thing off to replace with no. something? Never. Even if it's, you know, 18th century fabric. And this is uh has often found where the dress on a doll is made of remnants of fabric. They would never in a million years have gone out and bought fabric to dress a doll. They used bits and pieces from what they already had. And that's why you sometimes see, and I have larger dolls with this as well, where the dress is made out of stripes, strips, I should say, of different fabrics. So that might have been the different remnants from the mother's gowns that were made. This piece here is just an early paper doll that I've used as a dummy figure. Dummy figures were used to quote unquote people the room so that a room wouldn't feel so empty. Oh, how cool. People the room. I like that. And another sub-collection that I have is miniature books. So here's a couple of examples. I adore miniature books. Um, I just find them fascinating. I have miniature books that date back to even the 16th century. One thing that's wonderful about miniature books is they're almost always dated, just like big books are. And um, some of them are little miniature Bibles, and some of them are little verse books, and some of them are, are just little novels in miniature, everything you could imagine. And I, I think that they're just wonderful. I, I adore miniature books. I love your wooden men sitting there at the mm -hmm. table. Yes, men dolls are very, very few and far between. It's the same in, in, in French dolls, in bisque, in china, you name it. No different for early English wooden dolls. Men dolls are very, very hard to find, much more rare. I have one man doll for every eight or ten of female <laughs> dolls. <laughs> and let's see, what do we have in the dining room? Well, a gorgeous, a gorgeous girl right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can is see? This real silver? Yes, it is all actually real silver. And you know, um, it is, some of it is quite tarnished, but I actually prefer it that mm -hmm. way. It just looks older to me. I mean, yeah. I could shine it up and make it very, very shiny, but I, I don't, I don't, well, no, I, I don't have the time. <laughs> it's, and I just like it that way. And then, oh, I think I mentioned miniature portraits. You have some examples here. These are all miniature portraits that were not intended for a doll's house, but I think they just work fabulously. These are very, very early. I don't know if you can see that those we well. Can. There's it's a man and a woman, probably has They look like what how early? They look they look very early. Yes, those are probably very, very early 18th century. And then this piece here is a piece that probably wasn't intended for a doll's house, but certainly for a child. And it is a very, very rare thing. This is a miniature tea caddy. So tea was very, very expensive. It was, uh, the East India Tea Company had a monopoly on tea until 1833. So before the monopoly was disbanded in 1833, it was extremely expensive. But even after 1833, it was still expensive due to very high uh, import duties. And this is made out of toll, which is hand-painted metal. 
and this is so special and rare to have a miniature tea caddy. And this is completely out of scale, but I don't care. I love it. As I said before, I intentionally mix up scale. I, I, I put great big things in, little tiny things in, just to mix it up and make it more toy-like. I have another one that's even more rare due to its shape, which I'll share with you now. This one, which lives in another house, has a very, very special shape. Oh, that's divine. Wow. Look at that. It's wonderful. And I have this tiny, tiny pair of tea caddies. Remember I mentioned Dutch silver from the 17th century? These are from the 17th century and they're miniature Dutch tea caddies. And, that, and these have keys on them. It was so expensive that caddies often had keys and these keys, little keys actually come out. There you go. Wow, oh how neat. And they do open and close and you can lock them. And it's a miracle that the keys haven't gotten lost. Think of how many hundreds of years and those little tiny keys haven't gotten lost and that there's a pair still. What a treasure. These live in, I have a circa 1690 Dutch house. It's my oldest house and these live in that house. <laughs> oh, I brought this little book to show you. Just, I have, as I mentioned, I adore miniature books. This is a, one thing that you can find pretty commonly are miniature almanacs, miniature almanacs. And, and, the, and it, it's wonderful because you can see the year quite clearly. Uh, don't ask me what year this one is, but this is very, very early. And, um, and, and oh, uh, let's see, 1798. And this is very special because it's all hand done with little beadwork wow. and embroidery. A treasure. Mm -hmm. This is such a treasure. Susan, what would you like to say to somebody that is inspired by this and maybe wants to start but but sees yours and they're like how do I, I where, where does somebody start when they're thinking of maybe um, getting involved in miniatures and dollhouses well I can tell you this even though I started collecting when I was seven my first house was not a doll's house it was a mouse house and um, it was made out of in a wooden cigar box which you could still find today wooden cigar box just lifted the lid and I made this little room inside with those little fur, furry mice and just modern miniatures that my mother bought for me. And that was the beginning of this whole collection. So you can start small and move on up. And you can start with just, you know, if you want, you know, a, a shelf and a cabinet, mm -hmm. just like the very first house we talked about. The women and the ladies in Holland just started arranging things on a shelf in a cabinet and then it became a doll's house. And if, even if it doesn't, a cabinet makes a lovely place to have a doll's house uh, or room or whatever. It does, yeah. And um, you know, just little by little. You made a lot of things. Yes. You can find them out in nature. and Exactly. Yeah. How wonderful. This has been incredibly inspiring. I just cannot thank you enough for opening up your home to us. Uh, it's, it's, you have no idea how much this means to so many people that get to see this right now. Oh, so I'm, thank you so much. You're very welcome. I always love to share and I would just encourage anyone who's interested at all to, to learn and read and research. It's a wonderful world. A whole world awaits you and a whole world of history. So enjoy it. We will. Susan Dossiter, thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you very soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.